Amen. So John chapter 2, this is our second week in John chapter 2, and I'm warning you we're going to be in John chapter 2 for probably this sermon and maybe two more, at least two more from today, because I don't want to leave any stone unturned here um, in our Bible study of, uh, this is our first, this is the first uh, gospel that I've gone through um, since I've been preaching, so I want to make sure that we capture everything. We're going to focus on this story, the second story in John chapter 2, um, where Jesus goes into the temple and uh, flips over all the tables here. Look down at verse number 12, and then I'll uh, show you what we're going to look at this evening. The Bible says in verse 12, so Jesus has just um, performed his, he just started his ministry, he just performed his, his first great miracle by changing the water into wine. We looked at that um, last week. I encourage you to, to watch that. A lot of people misuse that story to justify being a drunkard, basically. So I preached through that um, and showed you that biblically Jesus did not make alcohol there. But look down at verse number 12, and let's look at the next thing that Jesus gets into here. The Bible says in verse 12, it says, "In this, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued, not, they continued there not many days. So they didn't really stay there long, and they went to Jerusalem in verse 13. The Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is, of course, where uh, the temple. So, of course, the Passover is when all these people are coming to town, right? And it's all these different people. This was the um, Acts chapter 2, the great um, speaking of tongues of, of, of different languages where they preached the gospel to everybody. It was during this time as well. Look at verse 14. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. So he found people basically doing business um, within the temple, and Jesus um, sits down and he makes himself a weapon here, and then he, he basically kicks them all out. Look at verse 16. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered what, that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Of course, they were, um, if you want to turn to Psalm chapter 69, this is what they are quoting. So the disciples actually know the Bible, so that's um, interesting um, as they remember these things. So um, this is a fulfilled prophecy in Psalm 69, verse number 9, where the Bible says, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon thee. So this is what they're quoting um, when they, when, this is what they comes to their mind when they see Jesus driving these people out of the temple. Now, this story is a, is a famous story in the Bible, in the Gospels. Um, it's actually not the only time Jesus does this, but um, there's two issues here with um, Jesus um, driving these people out of the temple. And there's two issues. The first issue is the one we're going to look at tonight, and it is the idea of money in church. Okay, the idea of money in church. And the second thing, the second issue that we're going to look at next week is Jesus' attitude towards these people. And we're going to just kind of explore Jesus' attitude next week. But tonight, we're going to look at this idea of money in church. Now, money is not something that um, I bring up um, a lot in this church. It might be actually my, my least favorite thing to preach on. But when we hit something in the Bible, this is one of the differences of our church versus many other churches, we're going to preach through everything in the Bible. So what was the problem here? As we look at this idea of money in church, I mean, look, the Bible actually talks a lot about money. The Bible talks in Proverbs, which I brought up last week in the sermon on bad counsel, the Bible talks about, um, you know, you shouldn't be just spending all your money, you shouldn't be going into a bunch of debt, all these different things. The Bible has a lot to say about money. So you can't really say, I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is all just before we get started on the sermon. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Meaning, if you love money, that's where all your troubles are going to start. Like everything that's going to just spring up and cause you problems in your life is going to come from the fact that you love money, if, if you do love money. So we're not to love money, but can you really say, according to the Bible, that we shouldn't care about money? I mean, you know, you have to, I mean, as a leader of your family, you have to care about money. I mean, you say, oh, I just don't care about money. Okay, go in your bank, go to your bank and take out all your money and just go give it to the first bum that you see if you don't really care about money. But obviously, the Bible does care about money and it cares how we, you know, there's a wise way to handle your money 
and a not wise way to handle your money. That's what we're looking at in Proverbs last week. But tonight we see this issue of money come into the temple or, you know, as we're going to look at tonight, into the church. And this is a big deal today. This is a big deal. There's a lot of people doing what is happening in this passage today. And look, what we're seeing in John chapter 12, uh, John chapter 2, verse 12 through 17 is actual doctrine here. We're actually seeing Jesus, like, explain doctrine of this, okay? He's, like, literally saying, you know, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. That's doctrine right there. When it comes out of the mouth of Jesus, Jesus is just saying, this is what you should not be doing. So the problem statement of this, and we're going to look at this whole idea of money and the church and how it works together tonight, but the problem here was that there was people doing business inside the church, inside the temple here, right? I mean, wh why were they doing this? Turn to, turn to Leviticus chapter 1. Why, did, why was there people selling doves and sheep and oxen? They're, they're selling cattle and, and sheep and, and doves. Why? Look at Leviticus chapter 1 and verse number 1. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically Leviticus chapter 1, chapter 1 through chapter 7 details all the sacrifices of the Old Testament on, you know, what they were supposed to do and what they could use, what they couldn't use. Look at verse number 1 of Leviticus chapter 1. I'll just give you a little um, taste of that. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord... You shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. So there were several offerings, and Leviticus chapter 1 through chapter 7 details these offerings. The main offerings are the burnt offering, there's a meat offering, there's a sin offering, there's a, um, uh, not the wave offering, the wave offering is a, uh, is a part of a different offering. There's a, there's a trespass offering, and then there's a peace offering. And I believe... Three of those offerings are, are you were able to use either uh, an, an ox, a, a sheep, or an actual bird. I mean, the peace offering, the sin offering, you could use a bird as well. You say, why? Well, because a lot of people just didn't have, you know, a bunch of cattle to, to you know, so they just, it was kind of a, a, a cheaper version uh, to have a peace offering or a sin offering or a burnt offering. They could use a bird too. So this is why these people are in the temple is because there's all these people, and they're going to be doing these sacrifices, these sin offerings. But there's money to be made here. <laughs> there's opportunity. There's opportunity. So, hey, why not have people, why not, instead of having them bring their bird or their ox or wherever from all the way from their house, maybe from another nation, well, hey, I got an idea. Somebody in the, in the temple probably stood up and said, why don't we just sell stuff here? And then people, you know, don't have to bring all these things. I mean, from a logical perspective, it, it sounds reasonable, right? And I'm sure the people, and it, the Bible doesn't point out on whether it was the, the priests of the temple taking a cut or what the cut was or whatever, or if it was just like independent businesses running inside the temple. But the point is, Jesus didn't like it. And Jesus says, this ought not to be happening. You should not be making merchandise, making a house of merchandise out of the house of God, is what Jesus was very clear about, his doctrine. All right? Now, there's many churches that sell things today. This happens all over the place. There's many churches that you can go to, and they have stores bookstores, you can buy DVDs, See, you, you probably don't buy CDs anymore, the kids are like, what's a CD? You can buy shirts, you can buy all kinds of things. By the way, things that we have here, but they're selling these things in these churches. These are things that are not to be done. That's what Jesus has clearly said here. Now, I'm going to give you two reasons that people sell in church today. All right. The first one, I'm not really even going to spend a lot of time on because I have beaten 2 Peter chapter 2 literally to death in the last uh, two or three weeks. But basically, it's false prophets. It's false prophets making merchandise of people, where the Bible literally says, you know, they, by their feigned words, they make merchandise of you. So false prophets, why are false prophets? This is a church that has a false gospel. 
This is a church that doesn't preach the gospel. This is some Pentecostal church that preaches works-based salvation. And what do they do? They're just making merchandise of people. They're just there to, to just make money. Okay, they're there and what? And so let's sell stuff too. So we can sell things, we can make more money. And that's, that's the point of the false prophet. One of the main motives of the false prophet is to literally just make money off of people. He's going to make merchandise of the people, but he's going to make his, they, they literally exist to make money. Okay, that's why you're going to see these big mega churches and they're never going to, they're never going to say anything mean to you. They're never going to say anything that might offend anybody. They're never really going to take a stand. I mean, look, all the Bible does is take stand after stand after stand. And it is crystal clear on all these issues of the day. That's why you're not going to see those things preached there. Why? Because they, they, just want to just, they just want to fill the seats. Because they're just making merchandise of people. So the first one, the first reason that people are going to be selling in church, having businesses in church, is because they're false prophets. They're false prophets, and they're just, their goal is to make money. You know, the Benny Hens and the Joel Osteens and all this, the goal is just to get as much money as they possibly can. But outside of false prophets, I've even been in an old IFB church and old IFB churches that also sold things. Before we moved to California, this was something that we did see. So the second, the, second re, the second category, sorry, of people selling in churches is, look, they're not false prophets. They have the gospel correct, and they're still selling in church. So you say, why? Look, we've been in old IFB churches where they sell materials, they sell gospel stuff, they sell music, they sell, they have missionaries. I remember we had missionaries come in. And the missionaries would, would play a, a song, and they would set up a stand in the back of the church and sell all their music. And look, you say, what's wrong with this? Because you, they sell all their music, and then the missionaries get the money, and they go and they continue, um, they use that money for their missions. Right? I mean, it sounds harmless, right? It sounds okay, except Jesus said not to do it. Except Jesus said, don't do it. Don't sell in church. So... We have to just follow what the Bible says in our lives. Now look, you say churches need money. It's true. Churches need money. So if we can't sell in church and we can't set up a coffee shop, now look, I mean, churches need money. Even this church needs money. You know, I can't just say, like, I'm the pastor of this church and I just don't care about money. Like, whatever. You know, the money we get, I just give to all the bums and, and everything's great. You know, I mean, church, I mean, look, there's bills, there's bills here, there's repairs here, there's, there's operation and maintenance costs here. And look, I mean, it's, it's true, I was thinking about Pastor Thompson's sermon, uh, when he, he gave us that soul winning, recharge your soul winning battery sermon, and he said, you know what, I can't wait to see what this church has in the future. And it's true that bigger churches have more resources and can do more things because of the resources that they have. That's a, that's a true thing. But turn to Matthew chapter 9. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. So while churches need money, we have to pay the rent here. We have to pay the utility bills here. We have to, you know, we do a lot of things that, that do cost a lot of money here. You know, the activities and, and, and bringing people to town. All of this um, requires money, but the Bible doesn't really focus on that when it comes to the church. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and look at verse number 37. Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 37. The Bible says this. This is Jesus. He says, Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Notice what Jesus focuses on here. He says the laborers are few. He says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth what? Send forth laborers into his harvest. So the Bible is saying that we need people. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know, look, the more people that we have, the more we will, able, we will be able to harvest. The more people that we have, the more we will be able to do. The more people that we have, the more people we'll be able to give the gospel to. The more people that we have, you know, maybe we have to go get a different building. 
the more people that we have, that's when all these things will happen. We say, who's going to pay all the bills? I mean, where does that come from? If I can't open a coffee shop and I can't open, you know, a bookstore and I can't start selling things, well, turn to Leviticus chapter 27. This is where tithing comes in. You know, this is where tithing comes in. The Bible is very clear about this in Leviticus chapter 27. But tithing is kind of when Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. He's saying we need people, but the doctrine of tithing is assumed. It's, it's assumed. That's where the church gets its, its resources, and that's what the Bible teaches. Look at Leviticus 27. Look at verse 30. The Bible says, and all the tithe of the land. And you say, what is that? Whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. That's important to note. Where the Bible says the tithe, whatever it is, and we'll get there in just a second, it says it belongs to God. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man would all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. So this is saying that, and then in verse 32, it talks about the tithe being the tenth. And again, in Numbers 18, it talks about, you know, a tithe is a tenth part. So basically what the Bible here is saying in Leviticus 27 is that 10% of all the harvest and all the increase, it belongs to the Lord. It's not that you're giving it to the Lord, it's just, it's His. All right, it belongs to him. And it says if you take out of it, then you have to pay 20%, a fifth part. You know, so one-fifth is, if you do the math on that, it's 20%, right? So the Bible is teaching that. Malachi chapter 3, of course, this is a, a go-to here on tithes and offerings. Matthew cha Malachi chapter 3, look at verse number 8. Again, this just backs up the fact that the tithe, is all, it already belongs to God. It, it's his. It's not like something that, you know, people are giving to God, it belongs to God. Look at verse number 8 of Malachi chapter 3. Verse number 8, the Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? And then God says, In tithes and offerings. He says, you are, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So this nation at this point was not paying tithes and not giving offerings. It says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, now, these tithes are grain and whatever their increase is. So it's a, a cattle guy. He's got cattle, a, a, a farmer. He's got grains, whatever it is. He's bringing a tenth of it in. There may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, say the Lord of hosts. I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and you shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her Fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So basically God is tying uh, a blessing to the people that actually give the tithe, and he's tying a curse to it in verse number 9, people that don't give the tithe. Now this isn't a prosperity gospel. This is just what the Bible says. All right? This isn't that, hey, if you, you tithe, nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. That's not what the Bible says. It's just saying from God, he's not going to bless what you do if you're, if you're stealing from him. All right? And people are like, okay, well... You know, you know, the, the um, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. You say, well, I mean, is it 10% after taxes or before taxes? Or how do I calculate that? The Bible says it's his in the first place. That's the first thing you need to understand. In Proverbs 3, 9, the Bible says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. That's super important right there. Because the Bible is saying it's the first fruits, meaning... God should be the first one that gets paid. You should give God the first 10%. You know, you don't give uh, Uncle Sam his whatever percent he takes, but you give, and it says, of all thine increase. That's important, too. You say, what should I pay tithe off of? Everything. Anything that you increase with, all right? Now, a lot of people say, well, tithing, I've known so many saved Baptists that are just like, yeah, tithing is not a New Testament thing. It's just Old Testament. So, I mean, same God, folks. His positions haven't changed. I mean, the, the meats, the drinks, and the diverse washings are, are gone, but it's the same God. If Jesus didn't revoke it, it's still in play today. The Old Testament is just as valid as the New Testament. And that just feeds into this doctrine of that there's like Old Testament God and New Testament God, which is just false anyway. I mean, Jesus is flipping over tables here. I mean, Jesus is dropping hammers on people here. We're going to talk about that next week and how that's a righteous situation. But turn to Genesis 14. Turn to Genesis 14. 
Let's look at a, a New Testament um, reference here on tithing. Look at Genesis chapter 14. Look at verse number 18. Genesis 14, verse number 18. The Bible says, so this is all in context of if I can't open a coffee shop, if, if a church, if, if Jesus Christ church on earth, we can't sell books and we can't sell things and we can't start a business here, you know, where are, how are we supposed to pay the bills? And the answer is tithes and offerings. And the Bible is very clear on that. Look at Genesis 14, verse 18. The Bible says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and he blessed Abram the mo of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Meaning Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Now if it wasn't for Hebrews chapter 7, we wouldn't really have like some clarity on what was actually happening here in Genesis 14. But the point in Genesis 14 is that Abram paid, it was Abram at that time, paid tithe, paid 10% of his spoil to this high priest. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 7. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, clearly referencing Genesis 14, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom, Abraham, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Again, equating the tithe to the tenth part. First being the interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. And you're like, who is this guy? Look at verse 3, though. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning, or end, beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ literally took tithes from Abraham. So it's literally Jesus was there taking tithe. Now turn to Matthew chapter 23. So Abraham literally paid tithe of everything that he had, everything that he took from the kings to Jesus is what the Bible was very clear on. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Let's look at Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 23, verse number 23, where Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So Jesus is, is pointing out that the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith, which I'm going to show you how, you know, faith is directly tied to money in church. But he's saying, these ought you have done. To what? Pay tithe. He's saying, paying tithe was right, but you're not doing these other things that you should be doing. But he's not saying you shouldn't have paid tithe. He's saying, these ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You know, but the Pharisees, what were they doing? They were just showing everybody how godly they were and how much they gave, and they weren't doing any of the judgment, mercy, and faith. And Jesus is like, no, you should be paying tithe, but you should do the important things. You know, do these other things as well. So look, the Bible's clear on this. I mean, I know people don't really want to hear this today because people, you know, just people really like their money. But let me just use an example of myself for you. I didn't always tithe. I didn't always tithe. But when I found out the doctrine of tithing, when I first heard that preached, I started to tithe. And look, I'm telling you, I give 10% of any of my increase. If I find a dime, I give a penny. Anything that I sell, that I give, it, it is nothing to do with you. It has to do with my relationship with God. I, as a pastor of this church, I need to be right. That's how I look at it. I give... 10, I, mean, I round up because I don't want to miss anything. And that is what we are supposed to do. Turn to Haggai chapter 1. I mean, I, I, I sell something and I make a little profit. I tithe on that. I don't want to miss anything. Why? Because it's God's. I don't want to be carrying something around that belongs to the Lord that I have not given to him. Now look at Haggai chapter 1. Let me just give you a little bit of a testimony here. I kind of read you a little bit of, of this kind of attitude in Malachi chapter 3, but Haggai chapter 1 sums this up so well. And let me just tell you this. I didn't always tithe, and then I started tithing once I knew the doctrine of tithing that was taught in the Bible. Because look, I, I'll be honest with you, I always gave to church. When I, when I was Lutheran, I gave to church. 
we gave to church. But I, I never sat down and, like, tithe. I mean, I never figured it like that. Because I, you know, should you or shouldn't you? I mean, it was, it was kind of a question mark for me. But as soon as, I mean, I got saved, I started learning the Bible, and I'm just like, I'm putting these things into practice. But look at Haggai chapter 1, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Look at these words here. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. You see what the Bible is saying here? The Bible is saying that this person in Haggai chapter 1 is just spinning their wheels. And I'm telling you, this was me. This was me. I mean, just spinning your wheels. I mean, I'm telling you, when I was, I was, I was saved for several years in North Dakota before I moved to California. And I worked my tail off. I worked my tail off at two jobs. I had a business that I was trying to grow. I was remodeling a house. I was building buildings. I was building, I was basically rebuilding uh, a business. And I had a full-time job too. And I worked my tail off, and I'm telling you, it was like, but, you know, and then look at the last part. It says, he earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in bags with holes. It was like, I, I, I couldn't get ahead. It's like, what's going on here? I can't, I can't get ahead. That's what the Bible is saying. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Look, if the Lord's not with you, it's like you're putting money into bags with holes in it. And I'm telling you, there's times in your life, and, and maybe you know these times or you've been through these times, where you feel like there's just nothing you can do where you can get ahead. And that's where I was. But look, ever since I've been tithing, I don't even worry about money anymore. I'm not, I'm not rich. I'm never going to be rich. But you know what? I'm not broke. And I don't worry, I don't worry about money. I, I'm responsible. I try to do what the Bible says as far as spending and, and debt and all these different things. And, and I give 10% to the Lord. And Haggai 1, I'm just telling you as a, as a, as a testimony, Haggai 1, 5 through 7 is true. All right? And the Bible you know, kind of gives that, that same methodology in other places as well. But look, here's the thing, folks. Turn to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9 talks about offerings. So tithing is one thing, you know, this 10% this to the Lord of any of your increase. But then there's something called offerings. And in 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul, he's taking a, a special offering from um, the Gentile churches to the saints that are being persecuted in Jerusalem. And that's what he's talking about through all of chapter 8 and into probably, I think, half of or more of chapter number 9. He's talking about this special offering that he's coming to, to collect. But here's the thing. When you think about this, tithing only makes sense. It only makes sense because, I mean, tithing and offerings, it only makes sense. Because if it was just like whatever you felt like giving, nobody would give anything. Think about like, think about like if your boss operated that way. Like you go to work for, for a day and you work really hard and your boss comes to you and he's at the end of the day and he's like, you know what, I feel that you, I feel that you worked for, I should pay you 12 bucks today. That's what I feel. It would be ridiculous. It's ridiculous to even say that. So to, to say that God wouldn't have a plan for his church is actually a little bit crazy. There's an amount. It's set. It's not about, you know, your feelings. And in 2 Corinthians chapter Nine, actually, where people, look at verse number seven. 2 Corinthians chapter nine and verse number seven. This is one that people will use and say, see, you shouldn't tithe. It's just every man give according to what he wants. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Paul's talking about this offering that he's coming to get for Jerusalem. And yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. He's like, you should give what you want to give. You should give what you can. And, and Paul's saying, if you're like, ah, shouldn't have to give this offering. He's like, don't give anything then. Because God wants a cheerful giver. But he's talking about some special offering. Look, we've never had a special offering here. But I'm not saying we never will. I'm not saying there might not be uh, a time where we need something or whatever and we, we have a special offering. It's biblical. It's biblical. I've just never done it here because we've always been able to fix stuff ourselves, and, and God's always blessed this church, and we found free chairs, and I mean, I've never had to. 
I've never felt like it was necessary. I actually just, you know, would like people to just kind of get to that basic doctrine of tithing because that's what, you know, the Bible clearly teaches. But it's not to say, you know, a Verity, they have the vision offering every year, and the vision offering is very specific. It's for very specific things. It's not just like, well, let me, let's fill the coffers. No, it's very specific for different things that are explained every single year on the vision offering. There's nothing wrong with that. It's an offering. And during the vision offering, pastor, it's not a tithe. Pastor Jimenez is always very clear on, you should give what you can give in your heart. You know, you should give, you know, willingly. You should give liberally. As Paul, you know, Paul's giving this advice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Another thing about tithing is if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 13, you know, Paul's kind of like, given a lot of examples about people that were really in a bad place that are still giving liberally to the church in Jerusalem. But look at verse number 13. He says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. So Paul here, then he goes into kind of like that it should be equal and all this. So tithing just makes sense, folks. I mean, it doesn't make sense that some people would give and then others just wouldn't. You know, like everyone just, you know, carries the, the load or whatever, right? Because Paul's just saying, like, it's not supposed to be that some people are eased and some people are not. It's supposed to be like everyone kind of has the right heart and everyone kind of helps out and everyone kind of pulls, you know, together. That's kind of what Paul is explaining in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. But, I mean, we're never going to sell in church. Let's go back to the point of selling in church. You say... Going back to the point of selling in church, we see that tithes and offerings is where the church gets its finances. Okay? It's how we pay the bills. It's how we turn the lights on. It's, it's, that's how it works. Okay? Now, here's mistakes that pastors make. Here's mistakes that churches make. And look, if a church, this is a pastor-led church. Okay? I mean, I don't know. Let me just take two minutes and kind of tell you how the, the money flows here. But basically... I don't really have a lot to do with the money as the offering comes in and it's counted and it's put in the bank and it's there's kind of this there's this methodology where the ushers count the money and then they everything's documented and then someone takes the money to the bank and then that deposit slip comes back and it's matched with the counting records and all these things I mean it's it's sealed tight and I really have nothing to do with that circle of that and I don't really want to have anything to do with that circle, but I decide where the money's spent. I mean, this is a pastor-led church. There's no committee here, you know, deciding where to spend the money. If there's a mistake on how the church spends money, that's my mistake. You know, I own that. You know, suddenly the church is just like, you know, broke and like we, we, we just, you know, we're in debt or whatever. I mean, that's my fault because those are my decisions, okay? Now, back to selling in church. Here's the, here's the mistake that pastors make. Here's the mistake that even saved pastors make. The tithes, the offerings, they feel like it's not enough. They feel like if we just had more, we could do more, which is true. But Jesus focused on the people, not the money. Okay, And the reason Jesus focused on the people is because the people are supposed to be taught the Bible. So the people should understand and be taught the Word of God, and as the people come in, the money's just going to happen. The more resources is just going to happen. Right? But what pastors do, saved, saved people. Their, their, maybe their heart is, is sort of in their mind in the right place, but it's not. If we just do more. We just start a business in church. We could just sell instead of giving the coffee away, we could just sell coffee. Instead of giving these resources away, we could just sell some of these things and we could add to this. We could do more. But that's wrong. Because that is, that is replacing faith with their works. You see? That's a pastor who is not... Look, I'm telling you folks, I'm telling you folks, we've always been taken care of here. We've always been you know, blessed here. Is it true that if we have more people that come to the church and more people tithe, we will be able to do more? That's true. But the Lord has always taken care of us. And I don't stress about that at all. 
Because I know that as long as we are, as long as I am doing things the right way, that the Lord will bless this ministry. I don't need to force God's hand. I don't need to ditch faith and, and force God's hand. This is the irony of huge churches. The irony of these churches with thousands of people, yea, hundreds of people, that they have to stop, start coffee shops and stores and all these things because, you know, these mega churches, they have to do this to make more money because nobody's sold out there. The people don't know the Bible there. No, we will never do that. And look, when we grow as a church and we grow as Christians, that's when we will do more. That's how it goes. Because if I took that faith away and I decided that I need to replace that faith with my works and start a business here, then God wouldn't be in it. Well, God's got to be in it. God has to be in it. Or what? This is the same, and, th and this, is, this is just the beauty of this, because this is the same mistake that individual Christians make. When they say, if I just had more money, then I could tithe. If I was just doing a little bit better, then I could tithe. No, wrong. You're filling a bag that has holes in it. The Lord has to be in it. If the Lord's in it, it just, forget about it. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing how God will put things together. People, that, people don't have money because they don't tithe. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's my experience as I see people in this Christian life. And that's actually, you know, my experience as well. I'm just filling this, I'm just filling this bag with holes in it, is what I was doing. It's them taking faith into their own hands. They're replacing the faith that they should have in God. Like, hey, if I do what God says in the Bible, God's going to take care of me. Instead, they're replacing it with their own works. So look, the Lord's always taking care of this church. I mean, even, look, even with bills and major unexpected costs, which we've, we've had a couple in, in the last few months, somebody always steps up and covers it. I mean, somebody, somebody pays for it. it. It's, so look, this is like a message that I, I don't preach a lot. No one's ever going to pull you aside here and be like, listen, brother, you know, what's going on? You know, no one's ever going to ask you to fill out some pledge card. Look, we've all been in churches like that. I've had both extremes here, actually, you know, where, you know, people don't give anything. And then I've had people come up and tell me how much they give and want extra treatment or whatever. <laughs> you know, none of those people are here anymore. Imagine that. But look, your tithing, your offering is between you and God. It's between you and the Lord. It's really that simple. And selling in church is the same lack of faith as not tithing. It's just a lack of faith. So nothing will ever be for sale here. Every single activity that we go to, you know, will be covered here because, you know, everything will always be free here, even though things aren't free. Things are always going to be free here. Why? Because that's how Jesus wants it done. It, it's, it really comes down to that. You say, what if, what if we run out of money, Pastor? Well, I'm certainly not going to go against the Lord Jesus Christ, even if we run out of money. I mean, I'm never going to take things into my own hands and do things against the way Jesus wants it done even if we run out of money but we're not gonna run out of money you know, because we I just as long as we're doing things the right way everything's fine and you don't even have to stress about it look to, uh, look at uh, oh you already were at 2nd Corinthians chapter 9 but the, here's one last thing I want to say one last ironic thing about people that sell in church in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I read you that verse where it says that God loves a cheerful giver. God wants somebody to give with the right heart, not grudgingly. He, he just wants someone to give cheerfully. So Paul is saying with that offering, he's saying, you know, give what you can cheerfully. If you're going to, you know, if you can give 10 bucks cheerfully to this special offering, but if you give 20 bucks, you're going to be like, eh, stupid Paul wants $20 or whatever. He's like, don't give, don't do that. But here's the irony of, of people that sell in church. 
they're trying to work around that bad heart. They're trying to, somebody's grudging, grudging. I mean, God loves a cheerful giver. That means it's a gift. I mean, the tithe is the Lord's. The 10%, that just belongs to him. If you're not giving it to him, you're just stealing it from him. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. <laughs> but the offering is God wants what you're cheerfully able to give, meaning it's a gift. It's a gift to the Lord. What the guy, the pastor, the church that's selling in church is doing is they're working around someone's hard heart, meaning I know these people won't cheerfully give a dollar, so I'll sell them a pancake, and then they'll, they'll be happy. Because what are they doing? They're getting something for it. They're getting something for it. The people that go in the church that makes a bunch of money through the bookstore or the pancake sales or whatever is, is not, uh, those people aren't, they're getting something for it. They're not giving gifts. They're getting pancakes. But that's what the, the church does, the pastor does, to work around this, this heart that is not cheerful. But the Bible says that we should just be cheerful. Look, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everything that you have is from the Lord. Everything that I have has nothing to do with me. It's just because God made it happen. And look, I'm old enough, I'm not old, but I'm old enough to where I was doing stuff and nothing was working, and then I didn't even know what I was doing, but I was right with God and everything's working. That's what you have to understand. God needs to be in your life. You need God in it. Or you're just going to be shoveling bags full of holes. That's it. Right? So look, you shouldn't want anything in return. You shouldn't want a book. If you want to give to the church, give to the church. If you want to, you know, give an offering, give an offering. You know, the tithe is the tithe, but the Bible is saying you should be cheerful about each other, right heart about it. You shouldn't need a t-shirt or pancakes or, or books or coffee shops or whatever it is. We're never going to have any of that stuff. So look, the Bible covers, I mean, does the Bible not cover almost everything about money in your life? The Bible covers how you should work hard, you should provide for your own in 1 Timothy chapter 5 in verse number 8. I mean, you're worse than an infidel if you don't work hard and provide for your own. Provide what? Stuff you buy with money. The Bible teaches us, you know, I mean, it's pretty good that, by the way, you know, God only takes 10%. I mean, Uncle Sam takes like 40 or 50, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean it's like, you know, and, and look, even as far as that stuff goes, we're not even supposed to worry about taxes. Like, I don't like the fact that the government's taken, you know, almost half of everyone's paycheck, but whatever, take it all. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to, you know, die on that hill, right? We're not going to go Kent Hoven on this thing and I'll go to jail so we can't preach the gospel to anybody except in prison. All right, so the Bible's clear on money. The Bible's clear on selling in church. The Bible's clear on where the church gets its money. And look, it's just, a, it's just the whole thing is a matter of faith. That, that's, that's all it is. It's just a matter of faith. And we're always going to be fine here as long as what? As long as we're doing things the right way. And you can apply that same thing to your personal life. That's why it's such a great, um, a great doctrine in the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.